It's a great pleasure to uh, present this seminar to you on practical guidance for environmental professionals on writing and interpreting conditions of approval. So this seminar is aimed both at local and state government staff in Queensland who must write and enforce conditions, as well as environmental professionals broadly in the private sector who must interpret what they mean. And I'm not going to attempt to describe every rule for writing and interpreting conditions. Rather, what I want to focus on are the main rules that apply in everyday situations and use particularly a couple of case studies. So I'm aiming in this seminar to be both a useful blend of theory and practice. I really aim in after work seminars to give you something that you can take away and you can think, I can apply this in my, you know, when I get back to my desk, desk tomorrow, this is something that's going to be useful for me. That's what I think is the, are the best after work seminars. So as I said, there's a two page handout uh, and a 14 page seminar paper with more details. I've summarised those in the slides. So because this seminar is aimed at Queensland professionals, I'm going to focus on conditions imposed under the Planning Act for the development sector, but I also want to uh, look at the Environmental Protection Act for the mining and petroleum sector, uh, and we'll see that there's a broad similarity between the requirements for conditions uh, under both regimes, even though you know the, the words in the test look very different and in practice they're very similar. So I'm also going to make some reference, and I've done that in the seminar paper and particularly to the EPBC Act, because again, it's the same sorts of uh, tests for conditions and you deal with the same sorts of issues if you're a professional uh, working in the sector. So I'd also recognise immediately that in practice, sta staff copy a lot. You don't work in isolation and uh, you don't start from scratch when writing conditions. So Anyone here work for government and involved in writing conditions? Cool, so we've got a smattering uh, within us. And I don't think there's any, uh, I should have said, there's, I don't think, apart from Olivia and myself, there's no one uh, lawyers, so we're all environmental professionals, is that correct? Yeah, so I'm, one of my real passions in terms of teaching is to try and explain the law uh, for practitioners, for the community, because I think it's so important that you have an understanding of um, the law and we don't just sort of cloud it in legal mystique in lots of cases. So that, that's why I like, particularly like seminars like this where we're talking with people that you know, are, are implementing the law uh, on the ground. So um, back to this um, point. Uh, in practice, people copy a lot. Uh, I know when I started working for the Department of Environment, was it then? turned into the EPA soon afterwards. Back in the 90s, uh, I, I finished uni and I got a job working for the Department of Environment up in Townsville and arrived uh, fresh out of uni, no training. Here's a file, applications come in, um, you know, assess it and uh, write some conditions for it. And it was before we'd integrated with the planning system, so it was under the purely the Environmental Protection Act system. But effectively what I did was basically go to the shelf, find a similar activity, take it out, copy all of the conditions across and then change the details of you know, the lot and plan, the address and you know, any relevant details and you just basically take the, we could call it a precedent, but we're just copying basically what's, done bef what's been done before. So large organisations like BCC, the Gold Coast, um, uh, City Council as well as DES and other departments tend to develop a lot of standard sort of pro forma conditions. So if anyone works for DES, then you know there's the standard conditions for the mining activities. Uh, so th there may not even be a lot of discretion with the conditions that you impose upon activities. It tends to be the bigger ones where conditions um, get varied. And whenever you're working with those bigger ones, you're never going to be doing it in isolation. You'll be, even if you're a new staff member, you'll be working with senior, ma you know, senior managers, people who've done these things before. So recognize that, that we copy, we don't work in isolation and we don't start from scratch. So no one needs to go out and invent a, you know, the conditions for development approval or a environmental authority for some complex development tomorrow. But having said that, while you don't, we, you don't work from scratch, a deeper and more 3D understanding, I was thinking of the right metaphor and I was really thinking of this seminar as 
trying to think about conditions like a Rubik's Cube. And I must admit, when I was a kid, I could never solve <laughs> Rubik's Cube. So, um, but I thought it was still a good uh, um, metaphor because conditions, if we, you know, so there's the really basic level where we copy and we really don't understand what we're doing. We just change the details and just apply it and fingers crossed, hope it's all okay. Um, but then as you progress, you'll deal with more complicated things and having that deeper understanding about why you're doing things and then why things might need to change for a particular uh, application, that can be important. And also, uh, if you work in your careers, you know, uh, as part of the policy um, sections, then understanding how conditions work and the complexities of them and the difficulties of them. And also with enforcement, uh, if you're in an enforcement role, understanding the complexities and how conditions works is also really important. So all of those things, of course I'm speaking there mainly about people who are working for regulators, but if you're in the private sector then you're dealing with those regulators and you need to understand what they are trying to do and how conditions work as well. So, um, so yeah, think of it in terms of gaining a deeper understanding even though we don't work from scratch. Okay, in terms of some general references, um, I've got a website with some recordings of lectures an introduction to environmental law in Queensland was a seminar I gave, um, some of you may have come to last year, uh, for EIA and Z. There's a recording of that. There'll be a recording of this seminar on um, the website as well as on the EIA and Z website as well. There's also um, a guide through the maze of planning law in Queensland, a series of lectures about planning uh, and some old, you know, some lectures about the Environmental Protection Act and the like. So if you want more detail on those things, you might, that's a source anyway. So with that background, let's look at um, what we're going to cover in this seminar. And I really want to build this seminar around two case studies, one uh, in DA conditions and one for environmental authority conditions. So I'm going to start with a case study of conditions in Sincere International Group, Proprietary Limited in City of Gold Coast, uh, a recent, relatively recent decision. Uh, of the Planning and Environment Court and uh, Judge Williamson. Uh, it's a useful decision and uh, it's uh, one I th and I've got the maps from the eCourts website so I can build up a really interesting case study around, around it. And then I'm going to look at um, a case study of the Ackland Mine uh, and Environmental Authority conditions and um, within those um, some topics within that. So with the first case study looking at um, assessing and writing conditions and then in the second case study particularly in, uh, interpreting conditions and problems if something's left out. So um, I thought hard about uh, examining the recent controversy ar around the um, approval of the groundwater management plan under conditions imposed in the Adani mine. Um, I was involved in a lot of litigation about the mine I'm very interested in the groundwater there, but I ultimately decided it wasn't the right case study. Um, it's an interesting one, particularly around the complex problems of using conditions of approval for adaptive management of groundwater. There's a lot of problems that we've got, I think, systemically within Queensland and Australia around effectively kicking the can down the road for groundwater into adaptive management plans. Um, and my own view is it's just a time bomb that um, is just ticking away that a lot of big mines have been approved with very poor conditions that are very going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to enforce. Um, so that is a complicated problem for a whole different seminar and I just thought I'd leave it. Um, but I would, if you're interested in adaptive management of groundwater and problems with condition, I highly recommend this article by Jessica Lee uh, from 2014, the Environmental and Planning Law Journal. Um, really, really great analysis um, of the problems and particularly lack of binding and legally enforceable obligations to adapt I think is one of the big problems we see and including in Indani but all of the mines um, at a state level and at a commonwealth level. So parking that, um, two real world problems, practical examples um, of problems involving um, conditions, Sincere and Ackland. So let's talk about the Sincere um, International Group case. So it involved development of land uh, at the Gold Coast, so um, 
down the Gold Coast, um, but just before you, or just after you go past Helensvale on the um, freeway, you just be off there to the left. Um, so focusing in, this is the, the land, if you just went on to Google Earth now, um, this is the land that was proposed to be developed and there was a proposal for a um, subdivision um, of the land. Um, this is the layout that was proposed. So can everyone see that? So see how it's like a big dumbbell at the top it's like got all the lots and then down the bottom um, can you see there's a big green bar and just to the right of um, the green um, so there's a white um, big block so the dispute in this case was about whether council wanted both blocks uh, as effectively to be um, given to council for environmental purposes so not to be developed and so the developer was basically proposing to give up one the one in green which was lot 901 but there was the fight was over lot 900 and whether that uh, should be given over um, as part of the conditions of approval for the subdivision and so focusing in on that particular parcel so Again, if you went onto Google Earth now, you'd see you know a lot of development around it, and um, it's that little patch at the bottom of the. So I just went down onto Google Street View, and if you looked in from the, I'll just go back. See, there's a uh, roundabout just on the left of that red circle. So if we just went down to Google Street View and looked across towards the land and the particular parcel that was in dispute, it's basically just on the other side of that little green mound. Um, and had been largely cleared. Um, so under the planning scheme, the land was, all of it was zoned uh, low density residential. So which is never a, a good look um, if you're wanting to, if you're a council wanting to protect um, land, if it's zoned for development, then that's a pretty good indication you're gonna lose. Um, but there was an overlay. Um, and so it just went on to, um, the Gold Coast City Plan website. And this is the overlay, if you went and looked at it. So the overlay, can you guys see up the back? So I turn the lights down a bit. But the overlay is shown there in the stripes. So notice down here that the overlay, the stripes, so this is for significant environmental um, land. The stripes covers what is lot, lot 901. But notice the corner there where lot 900 is, the overlay didn't cover it. It wasn't identified on the overlay of environmental significance for biodiversity issues. So the particular land that council wanted to be effectively donated uh, for environmental protection wasn't identified under the planning scheme as having environmental significance. And that was really crucial for Judge Williamson ultimately saying, no, uh, that a condition requiring that land to be given over was unreasonable uh, and basically rejecting that condition. So that's the planning context, really interesting uh, and really common as well. Um, things are often you know, missed in planning schemes, but pretty well the game's over. If, you've, if it's not identified in the planning scheme, you're not gonna get um, uh, much support from the Planning Environment Court arguing for its protection for environmental reasons. So. That's the layout again, and notice the green is lot 901, the white is lot 900, and so that's what the proponent was proposing. The green would be given to council, but the white would be um, not. And so uh, Judge Williamson in the judgment um, said there's no requirement for an assessment manager or this court on appeal to impose each and every condition that passes one of the tests in section 65, which is the key um, test in the Planning Act. Um, the power to impose lawful conditions on approval is a broad residual discretion to be exercised for proper planning purposes. And that then laid the foundation for his honour to go on and reason, well, there's not a proper planning purpose here because it's not identified in the planning scheme and the p and &E court isn't, it's not our job to basically protect the environment if it's not um, identified in the planning scheme effectively. That's not a good phrasing of of that, but that's effectively what happens. Okay, and then his conclusion at 89 and 90, since 
uh, sorry, Sincere International contends that condition eight is not a lawful condition having regard to section 65.1 and he accepted that. The first limb of 65 of the Act requires a condition to be relevant to but not an unreasonable imposition on the development and the condition failed that first limb because the measures set out in the condition were unreasonable uh, and therefore um, he rejected that condition. So that's an example of conditions being fought over, a um, lot of money involved and conditions are a ripe area for litigation because um, particularly with the development sector um, because leaving aside infrastructure um, charges which have a very restricted um, ability to appeal um, but for things other than infrastructure charges if a condition essentially let's just say it could be a condition on anything it could be an upgrade to an intersection it could be any sort of thing that's going to cost money and hundreds you know whenever you talk roads or any sort of infrastructure it, the numbers quickly become hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars and because it's a merits uh, you can um, developers can appeal um, and you have a fight on the merits about whether the condition is reasonable and a, a, a really important component of that is what is the contribution um, so if you're upgrading a road or something like that an intersection um, say you're a shopping center and you've got to upgrade an intersection because of all the traffic you're going to cause there'll be a fight often over what is the component of the traffic that your development will contribute and if you're only contributing 50% of the need for the upgrade say to an intersection then you should effectively pay 50% of that so if let's just say the upgrade is worth five million dollars so if council wants a hundred percent that's five million dollars it's going to cost you if you've got a traffic expert that says oh you should only be liable for 50 percent so on your um, view the condition should only cost you 2.5 million that's a 2.5 million dollar difference and that's a hell of a lot of money to go to court and fight over it so you can go along you can roll up with your best experts you can fight with council over it and even if the you know PE court just says you have to pay 60 percent you've still you know potentially save millions of dollars so it can be commercially just an obvious decision as a developer that you go and fight over it um, it's just a commercial decision and that's where a lot of uh, litigation is generated from conditions uh, expensive conditions um, if a condition doesn't cost anything then you know my view well typically clients don't care you know if it doesn't cost anything they want us to keep a copy of the DA on site big deal it doesn't cost it anything you know they want us to you know put up a you know let's just say as a safety issue or something with traffic and you know they want to put up one of those reflective mirrors that'll cost us 500 bucks to install you know not even worth um, you know getting your lawyer to write a letter for that sort of money you might as well just say yep we'll put up a reflective mirror but as soon as you start to get into say fifty thousand or a hundred thousand dollar cost or more then it can often be worth going and fighting over so um, this sort of litigation is um, bread and butter for the Planning Environment Court. So one of the things I really like about this case too is if you're um, not familiar with conditions of development approvals, um, you can actually get this one. Uh, it's on the eCourts website and I've put the link in the slides but effectively you just go to the eCourts website and then you basically just search for the file number um, and you know like the file number is um, 2001 116 of 18 so you can just do a search for the file and then there's a whole heap of documents there and in the judgment um, the uh, condition package is all included in the documents so you can have a look at um, those conditions of approval so if you're not familiar with DAs I'd really recommend going and looking at that or if you have any difficulties you can send me an email and I'm just gonna open up just to have a look at that because So the judgment in the case essentially makes orders that um, the, this is the orders, the appeal is allowed and the development application is approved um, subject to the development approval package attached here to and marked A. It's a really long um, approval package uh, with a lot of documents included in it, um, but it's 
standard for what you see, you know, the, the judge didn't write all of this, the parties come together, the council's prepared their standard, you know, their, all the conditions they wanted, the parties agree on what the conditions um, will be, and then essentially the judge just approves that. If the parties agree, then they won't go through and check, you know, every condition. So it starts with identifying um, the development permit, the land, and then notice here how they specify further development permits. So the following development permits are required to be obtained before the development can be carried out. Survey plan, operational work, landscape work, operational work. Why do you think you do that? Like, why in a, an approval, why would you put in, you need all these further approvals? Because I've seen some judges criticize it, or one judge in particular in the, in the um, uh, land court um, criticised this sort of putting things in that don't need to be there. But why would you put in something like that? If you're a council or you're a state government agency, why put a flag in there? You need further approvals. Yeah, that's a good point. You could say it's for completeness. Are there any other reasons why you might you know, help people to understand that this isn't all that they need. So they don't think they can go ahead straight away? Yes. It's just guidance. So putting in things like this, but particularly identifying exactly what the approval is for and what it's not for can be really important. I've been involved in a number of cases over where basically someone's misunderstood. You know, the planning system is complicated. A lot of people have no real understanding of the difference between a material change of use and um, operational works. Um, I think even a lot of lawyers are really vague on, you know, the, the terms are quite difficult to understand. So someone can get a DA and think, oh great, I can build my house now and not realise that, you know, if it was just a material change of use approval, that they may need further approvals. Um, and so putting in things to guide um, people, I think is a great idea, um, commonly done. And uh, particularly for the really complicated, so there's been quite a bit of litigation um, uh, under the Environmental Protection Act um, over complicated approvals. Because if you've got a big project, like say, you know, one of the gas projects or the like, where there's a lot of moving parts and you've got an approval for these moving parts, um, often there can, can be a dispute about whether something was part of an original application or not. And whether it's a, you know, it's because you got approval for this part of it, you also inherently got approval for another part of it. So there can be complicated questions about exactly what was approved and what wasn't approved. And one of the things, um, one of the key principles I want to emphasise with uh, interpreting conditions is you can't go back and look at the application documents um, just as of course. You can only basically. Uh, um, Approval packages like this have to be interpreted as a standalone package and you can only refer to another document if it's specifically referred to in the um, conditions or it's implied um, and Im implying things is often quite hard. If it's there in black and white, if it says a condition says um, like here, let's give, have an example. So here's timing, amended drawings. So your typical first condition is um, the assessing authority will take the plans that you submitted and they attach that as a condition of your approval and your first condition typically will be or an, an early condition will be that um, you must carry out the development in accordance with the approved plans. So. Um, you see there, condition three, undertake and maintain the development generally in accordance with the following plans, and then it identifies specifically what those plans are. So that's a, a clear example where you can refer to that document in interpreting the conditions. But if you don't have those specific cross-references, you can't assume that you can go back to the application and actually work out what was applied for. And you're going to, when I talk about the Ackland mind, that's a real problem right now, uh, is that the, basically the department stuffed up and didn't attach a map, uh, and now there is a massive coal pit that's been built 
with the miner arguing that um, there's no condition in the approval that restricts us to what we actually applied for. Um, so um, attaching a map sounds like an obvious thing to do, um, and it is an obvious thing to do, but it's not always done. Um, so that's the sort of first condition you typically see, and all they're, all they're doing is taking a plan that was submitted, and if they, you know, if you're a um, assessing authority and you don't have a suitable plan, well, you just require it before you get an approval. I, w you know, we want a, you know, um, a plan prepared by a, you know, licensed surveyor or an architect or something like that that's, you know, properly drawn to scale, um, that shows where the building will be, you know, and you make that then the condition of an approval because, if you think about it, if you just get, say you've got an application for a house. You just account for the assessing a house. You look at it; it's two stories. It's you know the plans show it's located on a particular part of the property. You assess it on that basis. You think, okay, well all the setbacks are fine. Tick, 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 tick. That's all good. That's what we've approved. But then if you go and give an approval and you don't actually link into one of the plans and you just give an approval, let's just say for a house, and someone else you know buys the land and says, I've got an approval for a house. I want four stories, and I you know instead of this 50% coverage, I want to cover the whole block. But I'm not, and then you might have a fight over, do they have approval for that or not? And if you haven't locked it down, what you actually approved, then you've got a problem at, at the very least. Um, in so you want to try and avoid those problems and so make it really clear. Okay, so that's um, you can see there's a whole lot of different conditions and a range of different things. And I just wanted to go to um, judgment was referring to condition eight. I think that must have been part of the original condition package because ultimately it was condition seven. Can you see here condition seven? This was what the fight was about in the case um, that. Uh, there'd be a land transfer and now it's just restricted down to the one lot which was that one shown in green that that there's a transfer at no cost to council the land identified below identify the land um, and what its purpose is there's a drawing of it um, the author the date so we're specifically locking down exactly what's being transferred there's no doubt about it so we can refer to that document and um, I won't go through the, the whole ab approval. Judge Williamson actually attached a whole heap of stuff to like the whole approval package is 177 pages long. So it's a really long judgment um, and he's included a whole heap of documents. Um, generally, you don't need to include everything, but it, you know, if you, if you cross reference to something, then you can refer to it later in interpreting an approval. But um, you have to think of an approval as a standalone document. Unless there's a cross-reference out, you've got a problem referring to other things, including the application. Um, so this was, yeah, what lot, what um, condition seven read before, I think. Um, uh, so you can see that the council wanted the transfer of both. Um, lots 900 and 901 uh, and so all that was rejected in the condition was effectively one of the lots but it's a very significant change for the developer so that's the final condition okay can I just summarize some practical take-home points and, and um, this is uh, in the handout that you received by email but um, key things I, I, I wanted to break up thinking about um, conditions as involving both um, a series of stages. So your first thing to do is to work out actually what, if you're, if you're like a um, consultant working for a proponent, you have to actually work out what you're applying for and then frame your application around that. So, you know, if you're in the development sector and you're making an application for material change of use, you know, you've got to be also clear okay well we're not applying for operational work so we're not you know and then obviously you fill out the relevant forms and you submit your application on that basis um, I say that that sounds outstandingly obvious um, but um, if you talk with people who assess uh, applications uh, they say you know they commonly get applications where people obviously don't understand the system 
and it's really difficult to work out actually what is being applied for and particularly if it's not someone who's familiar with the planning system then it's really difficult for them to get it right and your job isn't to tell them what they need to do but you know there's that um, difficult situation of how much help do you give them I know like the big councils like BCC um, you know if you're just a small landholder and you just want to do something to your block you know you can call up and talk with a planner and they can help you a bit um, but obviously for large developments it's you know up to the proponent up to their consultants to get it right so work out what you're applying for if you're assessing it also you have to be really clear on what you're actually assessing so if it's not clear what they're applying for then you need to make it clear or specify in the approval exactly what it's for sounds like an obvious point but there's just so many occasions where there's a miscommunication about what was applied for and what was approved particularly when the land is sold and someone else then has a DA that they weren't involved in the application process they just read it and they say oh I can do with this I can you know build this marina or whatever and I don't need any further approvals um, and then you know um, you can end up in litigation okay so clearly identify what the development is about and then in write, writing the approvals um, the approval should clearly identify the activity that's approved and the condition imposed upon it without a need to refer to the application. So you have to basically think of the approval as a standalone document unless you specifically cross-reference to something. And if there is a particularly important plan, then you, know, you should attach those things to the approval because you have to think that this application, you know, it might sit there for 20 years. The people might be long gone who assessed it someone is going to pick up this file and I'm sure that you guys work for organizations that um, have much better filing systems than the ones I've worked for but I remember when I worked for the Department of Environment there were these massive files you'd go and sift through them and um, as prior to I remember when I started working we learned about email and it was like an amazing thing um, so um, those days are gone, but you know the, the problem we face now as big regulators is you've just got so much. And sure, you can have tracking systems, but particularly as staff move on, it can become really hard to work out what actually was part of the application. And so if you can try and contain it all in the approval with key relevant maps and those sorts of things, then you're doing your job well and you're also um, making it a lot easier for people that will come after you. Okay, in terms of the key tests for the Planning um, Act, the key tests are that um, the conditions have to be relevant to effectively the jurisdiction of the decision maker and reasonably required. So um, effectively um, the tests are built around limiting particularly local governments just being able to... Um, so local governments are often short of money so if you've got an application coming in and you've got a power to impose conditions and um, you know this development is you know in one part of your shire can have these impacts on roads but on the other end of your shire you've got a bridge that needs to be upgraded completely unrelated to the development but why can't you say if you just had an open power to impose conditions why can't you require the developer to upgrade the bridge at say going to cost them two million dollars to upgrade a bridge that then you save having to pay for um, why why not do that it would be a great way to basically save ratepayers money um, and so the tests basically are particularly aimed at local governments to stop them being able to basically just take you know some poor developer um, you know at one end of the shire and impose a condition for them to do work at the other end of the shire that's unrelated to their development so effectively um, the conditions have to be a for a legitimate purpose of whoever's imposing them so within their jurisdiction and also they have to be a reasonable response to the impacts that the development will cause and that can be for things like traffic and it can be for you know a whole range of impacts screening noise any any impact that the development is going to cause you can condition so you've got a broad ability to put conditions um, to address those impacts um, but it really has to be related to that development and you just can't use it to get uh, money for other things 
So um, those are the key tests. Um, the the um, thing that I really want to emphasize is I don't think you need to get too bogged down in the tests. If you are assessing a, a project, I think you, I would encourage you to think of condition your condition making powers as a regulator like a broad um, toolbox or um, perhaps a different um, metaphor. The law gives you a frame with within which you paint the picture of what the conditions require to be done. So you've got these broad requirements, okay? Relevant and reasonably required. They're broad tests, but you know, if you're legitimately trying to address the impacts of this development, then conditions generally, you know, the condition making powers will generally allow you to do it. And the really the question you shouldn't get caught up in the the legal difficulties of, you know, the legal test really think about well, what are the impacts of this? What are we legitimately interested in protecting? And then basically make it happen. Uh, and you know, if, you, if it's gonna come to a fight, well, you can get great lawyers like Olivia involved and you know, they can go in and fight for you. But um, the, the, the powers are actually really broad. Um, if you're using them for legitimate purposes, generally you will be able to do it. So don't get, I don't think you get caught up in the, the legal tests um, and there's a whole there's a range of other um, tests for um, approvals um, one of the important ones to be aware of is that normally an approval should give finality that is it should actually um, not be subject to further approvals uh, now the rider on that is it's okay as long as uh, you can you can make something subject to say a further management plan. Um, so say, let's just say you're approving a, you're a local government, you're approving a set of shops and you attach a condition that there must be a landscaping plan submitted um, to the satisfaction of the, the council or something like that. And at first blush that might seem like it lacks finality and also that if it's just to the satisfaction of the um, council well, that hasn't really given any sort of certainty around what's required but the, the courts take a really practical approach to these things and um, as long as the condition isn't going to fundamentally change the development, then those sorts of secondary approvals are okay. Um, but whenever you've got something where effectively you give an approval but say you've got to come back and get an approval again for in, in some way that's going to massively change the development, then that's where you can run into problems with finality. You have to make a decision, but incidental things like landscaping, you know, groundwater management, maybe re rehabilitation plans, those sorts of things are commonly left to secondary plans that get approved by the regulator down the track. Um, yeah, so uh, if you wish a document such a landscaping and rehabilitation plan to be incorporated in the conditions of approval, you should refer to it. So yeah, if you want to do that, if you're going to leave it to a landscaping plan or something like that, you should basically say. Okay, so that's um, a, a key points from um, that case study. I just wanted to, to make a couple of um, extra points in relation to it. Uh, in the seminar paper that it will circulate, um, I've put in a little extract from the Commonwealth Department of Environment, um, put out a... Um, a guidance for its own staff in writing conditions. It's a really interesting document. I've put the links in the paper, but effectively they talk about prescriptive conditions, system-based conditions and outcomes-based conditions. And outcomes-based conditions have particularly been in vogue in the last, let's just say, decade. The Newman government particularly wanted um, regulators and the um, environment department to basically get out, you know, make um, approvals shorter, make them simpler don't have them going for you know pages and pages and pages and outcomes based things are seen as a simplification and a way of doing things where you just say okay don't do this or you know rather than telling them exactly what they've got to do um, basically just give them an outcome and let them achieve it in the most cost effective way and that all sounds great um, in reality Conditions are a blend of those three different things. Like if you take a map, for instance, or a plan that someone submitted, and you attach it and say you, you must, um, the development must um, 
be generally in accordance with the approved plan and you attach that, then that's very prescriptive. But it's also the great thing with that is it gives you certainty about what has been approved and it also gives the proponent certainty on what they can do. They can do. So it's a prescriptive condition, but um, is it reasonable? What do you think? If you take a plan that someone submitted and you attach it as a condition, is that a reasonable thing to do? Absolutely. That's what they asked for. How could it not be reasonable? We, we're giving you an approval for what you asked for. And by the way, you've got to carry out the development as you asked for it. Like, it's completely reasonable, um, but it's very prescriptive. And, you know, you'll have these complicated plans with, you know, I've been, I was yesterday, I was in um, some negotiations about a client, with a client and a couple of departments, and we're fighting over this stupid little thing and it all comes down to the plan and whether you know the development was generally in accordance with the approved plan or not and you're looking at the scale is that 4.7 meters oh no we think we've only built three meters out there and you know you, you're down to like looking at this survey plan and it's very exact but you know that was a condition of the approval so that's what we're stuck with so um, prescriptive conditions there's nothing wrong with a prescriptive condition if it's the appropriate way to deal with it so don't I don't think get too, there's, I think a lot of ideology around outcomes based is actually better. Um, to me, it actually, the, the document, the, the Department of Environment as they then were, where they are now, um, and the focus on outcomes based conditions, I think it's useful, um, a document to re read, but it glosses over to me what are the two key difficulties with the approaches, which are the level of detail um, to set out and whether to set qualitative or quantitative limits and outcomes. That's the really hard thing. Uh, and that's where, um, yeah, y you've got this, there's no often no perfect answer for writing. You know, you want to make the document as short as possible, but if it's a complicated development, then there'll be a lot of impacts and you might have a lot of conditions. <coughs> and that's just the reality. Um, but if you make vague qualitative outcomes to be achieved, if you just say, you know, there won't be any unreasonable noise um, generated, if that's your condition, well, you might as well, you know, it's, it's not really of any great assistance in, in identifying what is allowed and what's not. Um, at the other end, detailed prescriptive and quantitative measures can be really useful for giving certainty both for the pro proponent and regulators but they also can become um, so complicated that you know they're, they're difficult to themselves understand so <coughs> i i've called it um, in the practical points writing conditions of approval is often a goldilocks problem um, the aim is to provide sufficient detail and certainty without becoming too complex and unwieldy uh, and conditions of approval must balance the advantage and disadvantages of detailed quantitative conditions and simple qualitative conditions. And there's no single perfect answer to how you do that. And often it depends on the facts of an individual case. I'm talking really for, you know, anything from medium to large developments. You know, simple stuff where you just attach standard conditions and the impacts are really low, you know, probably not going to be a problem. But where you've got complicated developments, it's hard to get the conditions <coughs> right. And yeah, I would just emphasize, don't get stuck into, oh, it's, we've got to make outcomes-based conditions or you know, prescriptive conditions are bad. Junk those categories and just go, what is the best way to condition this so that we know what's approved and it can be enforced and the proponent also knows? Um, yeah, there's no simple answer to that. Okay, can I move from DAs to um, a case study of uh, Ackland Mine? I have been going for three quarters of an hour. Um, if I go for another 10 minutes, does that sound okay to you guys? Okay, and then, yeah, I'm conscious of um, time and I'm conscious that you guys have um, been at work all day. Um, so, case study of Ackland Mine, um, I just wanted to mention this because, um, you know, I could have just looked at Michael Williamson's judgment and said, oh, that all makes sense. But I really also wanted to point out what happens if something goes wrong um, and, and the problems with fixing conditions afterwards is, is basically, you can't, I was going to say you can't, but it's often really difficult. If you get the conditions wrong, 
uh, you as the developer, unless the proponent will agree to change the conditions, you can often have great difficulty changing them. Okay, so there's been extensive and ongoing litigation about stages two and three of the Ackland Mine. I've got a case study on my website. I've been involved in the litigation for landholders around the mine for the last several years. I'm currently waiting on a judgment from the Court of Appeal. Um, anyway, um, ongoing litigation about it. Um, but just to give you the key point that I wanted to make about conditions. So the mine is out on the Darling Downs, um, beautiful farming country, a um, few 150 k's um, west of here. So this is the mine now. Uh, this, the, this Google Earth image was taken on the 27th of January this year. And I'm going to focus in on West Pit. <clears throat> okay, so the mine currently has approval for stage two. Uh, and there's been a big fight for stage three. So stage three will basically extend from where the mine is now. Um, that image is looking south. So basically they want to mine um, some massive pits to the south. There's been a big fight over stage three. It's received um, the um, environmental authority. So it got approval from the coordinator general. The conditions were imposed upon um, the, the whole heap of litigation about that. Um, the environmental authority has been granted but hasn't yet commenced because the mining lease hasn't yet been granted. So they still are under the stage two environmental authority regime. Uh, and hopefully if we win in the Court of Appeal, um, the stage um, three EA will also get junked and we'll go back to uh, another fight in the land court. Um, leaving that um, issue aside, the thing I want to focus on is West Pit. So basically the mine, um, so here's West Pit in the foreground. Um, it's sort of the pit sort of going up to about where I've got the arrow there. This is all West Pit. And what you see there in the middle is Centre Pit. And then that was North Pit. Um, so basically West Pit is big. It's about four kilometres across by two kilometres north to south by about 50 metres deep. So it's a massive hole in the ground. And this is the stage two layout that was applied for. And I'm just going to focus in on it and just point out an obvious thing. So they applied for stage two back in 2006, and this is what they've got approval for at the moment. Um, West Pit is located in that area where I've circled, where there was no pit shown at all. Um, so that's all they've got approval for at the moment. You might think, well, if they, how can they be building a mining pit in an area that they actually never applied for for stage two? Um, Basically, the Department of Environment didn't attach a map um, to the approval. So there's nothing in the approval that actually, on the face of it, constrains the um, mine to the mine pits that they applied for. Um, and so the proponent has argued it's an outcomes-based mine. As long as we meet the conditions for noise and dust and all the other stuff, we can mine wherever we want within the entire mining lease. So they basically are planning to mine. So you see the three, the three pits of the shaded ones. They're basically planning to mine everything within the mining pit area. So kilometres of land that was never applied for as part of stage two. Because there was no map attached, um, that's their, their argument, which has been successful with the Department of Environment and Science, has basically allowed them to mine this area. Um, now, it gets a bit trickier than that um, uh, because the actual EA on the, fo on the face of it says um, that this environmental authority authorises the carrying out of an ERA and does not authorise any environmental harm unless a condition stated in the authority specifically authorises environmental harm. So the argument I, I've had um, in land court is their conditions of approval don't actually authorise them to dig anything. You know, they've got conditions about noise, they've got conditions about dust. There's no condition that says they can actually dig in the ground uh, anywhere. Um, of course, that has to be implied into the approval because they got an approval for a big open cut mine. It doesn't specifically say that they can mine, but that must be implied into the approval. But then if you're going to imply that into the approval, then my argument is, well, you've also got to imply in the map of what you applied for and that, that they are limited to what they applied for. 
So at this stage, um, we've had some litigation about that, but it hasn't stopped it. Um, the so, so I really want to emphasize, if you don't like do basic things like attach a map, you can have real problems with uh, enforcement. Um, I just mentioned also, so this is the stage three approval, um, and it does link in a map, um, but you probably can, I won't bother opening it up because we're going late, but essentially the map that's been, actually I will just, Um, the actual map in the approval is this fuzzy sort of grey thing. Um, I think it raises a really interesting question. If the um, uh, regulator attaches a map that is indecipherable, can you refer to the application document to get a copy that you can actually understand? Or are you stuck with something you can't even read? Um, but essentially, this was imposed by the Coordinator General and it's really vague and the, con the key isn't very clear at all. I don't think you can read this, but it's got this key that basically, it's really unclear exactly what was approved and what wasn't. So even for stage three, which is this massive mine, um, billions of dollars worth of coal, and the map is very difficult to actually identify what was approved and what was not. So, um, I really emphasize basic things like have a really good map, attach it, lock down what was approved, and it then makes enforcement a hell of a lot easier. Um, so is West Pitt a breach of the EA? My view it is. Um, another question is, can the department do anything about it? So if they left out the map, can they amend the EA? Uh, and in fact, the Environmental Protection Act, um, I've already Practical points from this case study are um, conditions have to be reasonably clear. Um, generally, you interpret an approval as a standalone document and you can't refer to the application documents unless they're basically cross-referenced or they have to be implied into the approval, but that's really problematic. Um, so you take a reasonable approach in interpreting conditions um, and don't be over-technical in how you construe them. But you know, if there's something obvious missing like a map um, and there's no condition there saying they're constrained to that, then you've got some real problems as a regulator in enforcing it. Now under the Environmental Protection Act, there is a power for the department to amend conditions uh, if one of the um, triggers is if there is a significant change in the way the activity is being carried out. So you might think this is a pretty significant change, um, but the regulator for several years has basically not exercised the power to change the conditions. So there can be powers to change conditions. They're generally very limited. But basically, if you um, get it wrong um, in an approval, so the final point I've put on the practical, sorry, the practical um, uh, points to take away from this, fixing mistakes and problems in conditions is often hard unless you can get the proponent to agree and obviously it's going to cost them a lot of money there's no reason why they should um, or they might just take a commercial decision and just say no we're going to do you know these are these are the conditions we could have appealed them if if um, we thought they were going to be like that but you didn't give those conditions and we're not going to agree now they're legally entitled to do that um, so fixing mistakes um, is problematic you have to get it right um, when the approval is given so, wrapping up, look, two case studies. I hope they're a useful overview for you. Um, conditions are complex. There's no two ways around it. Um, when you look at an approval package like um, Sincere International or the Ackland Mine, there's a lot of things going on. They go for pages and pages and pages, cover a whole heap of activities, um, a whole heap of impacts of a development. If you aren't familiar with conditions, I really recommend going and having a look at the Sincere International condition package. I think you'll get a lot from actually looking at a real document. I certainly believe that, you know, um, the, you won't understand the tests for conditions until you actually look at how they are implemented in practice. And once you see a few documents, it becomes really clear. Okay, yeah, these are the sorts of things that are typically there. If you do that, yeah.
it was really helpful. So I'd really recommend if you're not familiar with um, conditions to go and have a look at, say, that approval. If you have any problems, drop me an email um, and yeah, we'll send you the um, two page of notes and the paper. Uh, again, if you've got any questions, um, you're welcome to just shoot me an email. Um, if you think there's anything that would be improved in terms of this brief overview of conditions for people who aren't lawyers, then also I'd love to hear from you about that too because um, it's often hard when you're a lawyer and working in an area to actually try and think how do people who aren't familiar with this, how do they see this for the first time and what are the difficulties they have. So um, I hope that summary is useful for you. And um, do we have some time we for questions? We do have time for questions. I thought I might just weigh in with two small comments while we can think about some tricky questions for Chris. The two things I wanted to mention was the court is very aware that conditions are not drafted by lawyers or draftspersons, so they're not looking for real precision in language, but it doesn't really mean that you can be vague or uncertain because I've seen conditions drafted quite deliberately in a vague way where the writers thought we might be able to use this to our advantage at some point. It doesn't allow that to happen, and if something is vague, it's at very real risk of being challenged. And I'm not sure if you mentioned it, Chris, or I might have seen it in, in the handout, that when you do have a condition that is vague or uncertain, the general interpretation rule is it will be construed in a way that puts the least amount of burden on the holder of the approval or the owner of the land. So it won't always act in a, in a good way if you're a regulator. The second thing I want to mention was um, when you've got a complicated development, you might look to have some guidance on, at the, you know, you might look at the conditions of similar type approvals to sort of get a feel for what conditions you might be confronted with. But there really is a limit on the extent to which you can draw some parallels. And I'm talking here for complicated development, not your standard of conditions for your normal or regular mine sites or something like that, the tricky ones. It's all very much going to turn on that site and in Sincere, what overlays were there, what overlays weren't there. So there's not a lot of parallels that can be drawn by looking at the way other developments were treated and what conditions are there. And in terms of trying to argue that you should have a similar condition in those same terms for a subsequent approval. So they were just two brief things from me, but I'm sure there's some questions out there. Yeah, and I'd just say I absolutely agree with that. Yeah. And the irony is, you know, the whole push for standard conditions mm -hmm. under the, um, particularly under the Newman government, there's a real push for standard conditions, particularly for the small environmental approvals. And I just, I, I'm sure um, Olivia has the same sort of reaction as me. I'm just thinking standard conditions, you know, it should be, you know, you should be thinking about what you're approving and then basically tailoring the conditions and not including things that, that aren't necessary. I understand if you've got a lot of small things coming through that you might want to just set, you know, if they're small scale. But, uh, yeah, standard conditions, I totally agree with you. You ultimately need to think about tailoring them.